This is a Clark University podcast. Shakespeare is interesting because, you know, Shakespeare is a sort of behemoth of colonial power and, and sort of the English project, right? It's the vehicle for the cultivation of Englishness in America, right? Along with the Bible. Do you want Shakespeare to be the sort of ambassador for white Englishness and proper speech and all these things that we often you know, are kind of approach Shakespeare with? Or do you think Shakespeare is something that students shouldn't be learning? I think that's very relevant to this, this kind of conversation, what's been going on in our world, because um, the powers that be in these political entities want us to stop talking about Shakespeare as anything other than the site of sort of white, straight, cultural power. Shakespeare is at the heart of Clark English professor Justin Shaw's research. The playwright and poet is perhaps the most famous writer in the world, and a common fixture of English classes nationwide, until recently. As Justin explores teaching methods that allow his students to analyze the contemporary world through the themes that emerge in Shakespeare's work, book bans in the southern United States are targeting texts that address topics of race, gender identity, and sexuality. These bans have led some educators to drop works like Romeo and Juliet from their curriculum. To be or not to be, that is the question. Or at least it used to be. Today, it's become to teach or not to teach. Even what we think of as static vocabulary and static knowledge is always changing, is always open to interpretation. What one person thinks of as white is not the same as another person thinks of as white, for example. There is no one definition of these things. And I think being okay with that is actually a good thing. I'm Melissa Hansen, a producer in Clark's communications office, and this is Challenge Change. Justin sees Shakespeare's body of work as a way to engage in scholarly discussions about queerness, anti-racism, anti-ableism, and self-exploration. As these texts are challenged by education officials and communities, Justin believes teachers must think more deliberately when lesson planning. We turn the table around and say, if you want to use Shakespeare to shut down these conversations, we're going to use Shakespeare to wrap up these conversations. Because the language is always changing, right? Once you think you figured it out, get ready, like you haven't figured it out. And I think being open to the changing nature of language and identities and the ways that we interact with the world uh, and bringing that into our discussions of Shakespeare is important. Why? Because it happens today, but guess what? In Shakespeare's time too, they're also wrestling with the same issues. They're wrestling with how to talk about race. They're wrestling with how to talk about sexuality. They're wrestling with how to talk about class and religion and all these things. They went to war on religion right after Shakespeare died. And so, yeah, I, I think that, you know, making it clear that the issues that we are grappling with today, that individuals and systems are grappling with today, um, Shakespeare's world is also grappling with them. These texts represent sort of moments in time right, that represent the slipperiness of terms and vocabularies, that just make them even more, more of a site for the exploration, for the deep dives. Helping students walk through how to read something like race in the text, how to notice the language of racism, what certain terms would have meant in Shakespeare's time and all their capaciousness, and how we still don't know how to talk about certain things in, in a sort of common way, I think is, is important. Justin comes from a family rife with educators. He grew up with a mother, grandparents, and other extended family members who devoted their life to teaching. Seeing book bans emerge across the South hit close to home. This person who grew up and spent a lot of time in Texas, and my family is still in Texas. My family has always been involved in education in, in one regard or another. It hit close to home. I very much uh, worry and, and concerned about family members who still have to deal with this kind of stuff in their own classrooms today. They can't teach what I get to teach. I remind my own students often that we have an incredible privilege here at Clark to be able to discuss openly uh, very important ideas about race and racism, about gender ori uh, and sexual orientation, about class 
and religion and really you know be honest with ourselves and uh, and, the, and these texts about the work of these issues in our own lives that doesn't happen anymore in places like Florida or it's really difficult to have those open conversations not just at the K through 12 level but even at the university level in many public institutions and so uh, it's just it's stressing to see instructors being fired right for even bringing up Shakespeare Justin is energetic when he talks about Shakespeare. His appreciation for the plays and poems and how they can help people understand themselves and the world is a departure from his first impression of the bard. Justin was introduced to Shakespeare in middle school, and he was not a fan. I was taught that, you know, you're supposed to just love Shakespeare because it's Shakespeare. Um, I remember very vividly sitting in my um, high school class, being read Shakespeare on some cassette tape, and the teachers, eh, for different reasons, I don't really blame them, but uh, didn't really have the capacity and resources to make Shakespeare accessible to us and to teach us how to enjoy Shakespeare. At the time, I was in Texas, so I'd never seen a Shakespeare play performed live or even uh, in recorded fashion. And so there wasn't really an entry point for me as a young black guy in Texas reading about some despondent white prince you know, who's <laughs> whining about stuff and never doing anything about it. Once I got to college and started doing Shakespeare again in my classes, I actually went to study abroad in London and ended up taking two classes in Shakespeare in London. One of them was a theater-oriented Shakespeare class where we really did lead with uh, the productions. And there are lots of productions in London to see Shakespeare. And I got to, for the first time, really see Shakespeare um, performed by real people and get to really feel why Shakespeare has gotten to the point of sort of celebrity status now. I also think that, um, you know, those classes helped me to sort of see myself in the larger, broader conversation of Shakespeare studies, and, uh, and that really helped. As Justin earned his PhD, he reframed his thoughts about Shakespeare's role in the classroom. Once I got to my PhD, I realized, you know, this is what I want to do, not only because you know, Shakespeare has a lot of currency in the world. If you're going to find a job based on kind of an author, Shakespeare, you know, it, it still has a kind of currency for better or for worse. And I actually think I can think through a lot of important questions using Shakespeare, starting with Shakespeare. There are other authors you can do this with as well, but there's been so much work around Shakespeare that I think it's a great place to start, right? Uh, whether students have a sort of positive relationship with Shakespeare coming into the class, or have a negative experience. They have an experience for the most part. And I love to work with that. And I love to sort of guide students to wherever they end up with Shakespeare. I don't teach Shakespeare as like an appreciation class because I know what it means to not appreciate Shakespeare. I love to teach ideas. I love to teach how we can use Shakespeare as a starting point to think through ideas about relationships in the world and family and power in the world, for example. My own research is about race, and I think about the ways that racial language and racist behavior cultivates in the plays of Shakespeare themselves and in Shakespeare's world that show up in the plays. And then how we can learn from that, how uh, the, the examples we see in the plays mimic and anticipate some of the things we see in our own world. So I'd like to bring out these things in play that, aren't, that are about Shakespeare, but aren't about Shakespeare at the same time. And I think that's the way I sort of try to engage students, and that's the way I start to enjoy it too. In response to book bans, some Florida educators are only teaching excerpts of Romeo and Juliet. Justin feels that to truly immerse oneself in Shakespeare, the plays must be read as a whole. A lot of students will want to uh, me to tell them to only read Acts 1 and 2 for one class and then pause, and then read Acts 4 and 5, 3, 4 and 5 on the next day. And I'm like, you can't stop! It's like stopping a movie in the middle of a class, in the middle of the movie. Uh, just read the whole thing. And so it's hard for me even to excerpt any part of the text because it needs context, right? Um, every piece of the literature needs the surrounding literature around to make sense of, even on the basis of what's going on in that text. I think that helps and aids in the interpretive process. When you take a piece out of the text, you cherry pick just like what happens with like the Bible, for example. Now you're putting it into a whole new context. It limits interpretation 
and forces students to accept whoever their teacher's interpretation of the text might be. I think it does our students a disservice. Not only the students who are currently in K-12 schools, but those students will eventually be in colleges and universities, who will eventually be in law school, who will eventually be in medical school. It robs students of the opportunity, teachers and students of the opportunity to fully engage with the text, but also allow themselves to access this text in, in, uh, in ways that make sense to them in the world. And I think the best way we can prepare students for that world is to give them a broad range of interpretive ideas and practices to engage these texts. Since the 17th century, novelists, filmmakers, and directors have taken Shakespeare's stories and added new flair. Some listeners may remember the 1999 film, Ten Things I Hate About You, loosely based on The Taming of the Shrew. In faith I do not love thee with mine eyes, for then thee a thousand errors know. But tis my heart that loves what they despise, who in despite of you is pleased to dope. Now, I know Shakespeare's a dead white guy, but he knows his shit, so we can overlook that. Justin thinks these adaptations are part of what makes Shakespeare great. I think that's what allows so many people to continue to interpret Shakespeare and allows that, that tradition that starts in Shakespeare's time to flourish. That there is no one interpretation from a theatrical perspective or from a literary educational perspective. Everybody can find a way in. It just takes the right sort of liaison. Someone who cares enough to make Shakespeare and see Shakespeare as open. A teacher or a director of stage or film cannot see Shakespeare as closed off, cannot see Shakespeare as elite. So it takes someone to mediate between audience, students, readers, and the plays themselves. It takes someone who's willing to kind of see the openness and accessibility inherent in the text or allows that to kind of come into the text, to the conversations. I love the work that the Royal Shakespeare Company does in the UK in making their theater in general, but the plays themselves accessible for disabled audiences and neurodivergent audiences, for example. I love the work that scholars who work in queer studies and uh, critical race studies and disability studies are doing uh, in the last two or three decades to really read themselves into the text, read ourselves into the text, so that we're not just rehashing the sort of norm of Shakespeare as a dead white male writer. And then we do kind of love to filter that into our teaching, and that's the sort of foundation, because that's who our students are. Our students are constantly thinking about who they are in this world and trying to find their truths. For Justin, the sweet spot is recognizing Shakespeare's incredible impact on literature and the English language, while acknowledging the bigotry and prejudice woven into the text. I think ethically, my job is to sort of lead with both. That Shakespeare is powerful and the language is beautiful, and yet there is still harm here. I love teaching a play called Titus Andronicus, which is Shakespeare's earliest tragedy and a very bloody, very problematic play in a lot of ways. And there's a black character named Aaron, Aaron the Moor, in that play. He's often seen as the villain. But he's only the villain insofar as he's rejecting and dismantling and disrupting the structures of the white Roman empire in that play. And so, you know, I think that you can sort of play around with the ways that that text is speaking sort of truth to power in Shakespeare's time. I think that, you know, teachers have a, a, a really difficult but um, amazing opportunity to still locate the revolutionary aspects in these texts, allowing teachers to be even more creative and subversive in their approaches, and which allows students to do the same, I think. I have a lot of faith in the teachers to continue to, to bring their subversive energy and pull out ways to identify those moments of self-discovery and such to take place. To learn more about English at Clark, visit clarku.edu slash English. Challenge Change is produced by Andrew Hart and Melissa Hansen for Clark University. Find other episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. One, two, three. Clark! <laughs>